Thank, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, just briefly, you know, uh, should we refer to you as Mr. or as, as Colonel Mulife? Or is, is, is the, the title of Colonel an appropriate one to refer to you? Or we can just refer to you as uh, Mr. Mulife. When we dealt with uh, the terms of reference, for this process that we're engaged in, we ultimately adopted a document which said that the object of this process is to investigate allegations of governance failures at ESCOM, Transnet, and DINEL. And broadly because of a genuine observation that had been made that there's a family, a Gupta family, whom you say you have visited recurrently, which appoints board members of state-owned companies, influence the appointment of senior executive, determines how procurement should be handled and who should be recipient of such procurement. So amongst others, that is the, the context within which you are working at. So, all the questions that we're going to deal with here are ultimately directed towards uh, finding certain in terms of what we're dealing with. So you're previously with PIC, so did you have any work in between PIC and Transnet? When I left uh, PIC, I um, had a, uh, an agreement with Investec uh, where they uh, agreed to, where we agreed to look for investments in property uh, with the Investec property division. Um, and um, so I was going to work, we were going to work together uh, to identify these uh, opportunities. But um, eventually, um, uh, I decided that um, I would go to Transnet. And uh, uh, that is where I went. You decided that you're going to go to Transnet or you were approached that you must go to Transnet? I decided to go to Transnet. Oh, oh, oh. There was a vacancy there, and then you applied for it. Yes, there was a vacancy for a chief executive officer. Okay, at what time did you meet with the members of the Gupta family? Uh, was it during that time of working for Investec, or after you had been employed in Transnet, or far much earlier? Uh, Before, I have said that they had applied for funding at the PIC, which we declined. So I knew them by then. So of those Gupta members, who did you specifically had, had, had met before? AJ, Atul, or? Mr. AJ Gupta. Which one? AJ. AJ. Yeah. So that is the one that you had relations with. So when you were working for Investec, was there a time where Fana Shungwani came to you and said that they can find you a better job elsewhere than working for Investec in a small desk? No, no. No. You have never had any in, in interaction with Fanat Longwani during that period? No, I met Fanat Longwani at Norman Mashabani's funeral. Uh, we talked a little bit, that was it. And before you applied for the Transnet job, uh, did you ever meet with uh, Mr. Jacob Zuma in that, in that period there? No, I did not meet with Mr. Jacobson. Did you meet with any members of the Gupta family or, or any of the following people? Salim Issa or Gary Peter or Nazim Hoa or Anod Singh before you took the job in a Transnet? No. I actually have never met Mr. Salim Issa. Gary Peter, I met at uh, Transnet. I also met Anod Singh at Transnet. So, so what, when, when did Anat Singh uh, arrive in, uh, in Transnet, before or after he had arrived there? At Transnet? Yes. Anat Singh, I found him at uh, Transnet. You found him there? 
Yeah, there was a Mr. There was an acting Wells. Mr. Chris Wells was the CFO. And Gary Peter, you found him there as well. Yeah, Gary Peter was there as well. And have you ever met with Eric Wood? I think Eric Wood came to Transnet once, wanting to do a very a, a hedge, some kind of a transaction, a financial, very complicated transaction that even I found uh, I didn't understand, and I I dismissed him, and I said no. I don't have, understand. Have you ever met with Nazim Hoa? Yes, Nazim was, a, was at the New Age. You met him when you went Transnet? When I was at Transnet. And then what was the context of the meeting? He was at the New Age. They wanted sponsorship for the breakfasts. They wanted... Um, uh, he called me about um, news-related things for the New Age at the time. And, and what ended up happening? Did you end up giving them any contract from Transnet? Yeah, the Transnet did sponsor the New Age breakfasts. But uh, yeah, we did sponsor the New Age, several of the New Age breakfasts. And then has Dudizani Zuma ever spoken to you about anything uh, when you were in Transnet, uh, or maybe later on when you were in ESCOM? No, we have never spoken about anything with uh, Mr. Duduzani Zuma. And but I have met him. We were at some birthday party of a one-year-old child, and he came. And then when we were working in Transnet, how would you rate your performance there? You think that you had brought some degree of stability and proper governance in the executive when we were there. How would you rate your performance in Transnet? My performance was rated by the board, and um, and what were the observations? I can't I can't remember that the board had uh, issues of underperformance from myself. So everything else was fine there. Yes. And then who approached you to go to ESCOM? You decided as well that they're going to go to ESCOM. No, it was uh, Minister Brown, who said, uh, "Look, we have very serious problems at ESCOM. Would you consider going there?" on an acting capacity. And then when, I said, when did it come to you to say that would uh, you I consider going the, to... I can't remember the exact date. I can't remember, but it's before I went to ESCOM. But were you aware who is leadership of ESCOM at the group uh, uh, chief executive level at that time when she approached you? Was I aware of? Who was leading ESCOM at that particular time? Yo, there were problems there. People were suspended and so on and so forth. I didn't know what was happening. So you don't remember that there was a person called Mr. Matuna who had just been appointed less than six months and had just been suspended as well. Former DG of Public Enterprises, which is a department which we are reporting to. We had just arrived there and then they say, new CEO of ESCOM, I'm sure you possibly knew about that because the former DG of Public Enterprises and then Minister Brown comes to you and says that, would you consider acting in oh, ESCOM? Did you say Mr. Matuna had been suspended? Yeah, because uh, isn't it that you said that when you, they approached you, there was, some, there was a problem in ESCOM? Yes. Mr. Matuna was suspended. So you, you're not worried that, okay, here is the DG whom, as Transnet, will report to. He was working as a DG of the Department of Public Enterprises within the, within the six months. He is now an executive in ESCOM. He is suspended, and now they're saying, I must go and take the responsibility. Didn't that raise some red flag around the, your, your thought process? Um, at about that time, I actually had gone to a bank during the day to do something at the bank. And I arrived at the bank, at the Standard Bank branch. And I found the manager at 11 o'clock during the day standing outside with his arms folded. And he said, you can't go into the bank because there's no electricity. At about that time, I remember being caught up in traffic in Santin. Santin, during load shedding in the evening, became 
pitch black, very dark. And it took hours to get from Santen to Irene, where I stay. And I was very angry, as a South African, that Santen has shut down. Santen needs candles. A branch of Standard Bank is not operating at 11 o'clock during the day because of load shedding. I was very angry. And um, when the minister said, would you go to ESCOM to help solve those problems? I said, yes, I will go and do my best. Do, do you know why I'm raising the issue of uh, Mr. Matuna is, is, is because when he came to give evidence here, he says that he was employed uh, as GCE, and then a new board was appointed, like new board members were added into ESCOM. And in a meeting which is supposed to be their induction, they suspended him without clear reason of why he's being suspended. And then he said that he didn't want to waste his money fighting against a huge state-owned company and going up and down and all of those things because he didn't have the deep pockets. And amidst that, you are then brought as a GCE. Didn't you question what happened to the previous CEO? I want to have a handover process of what was happening uh, before because actually one of the things that Tidiso Matuna says, or Mr. Matuna says, I don't know if that is the correct name, the first name. Uh, he says that Brian can't claim that he brought stability to, to ESCOM because we were on our way to bringing stability and and dealing with load shedding uh, long before he came there? Uh, well, I never engaged with Mr. Matuna on those matters, nor did I involve myself in uh, the issues uh, with Mr. Matuna. He was suspended, and they asked me to be acting GCE, and I went there in an acting capacity. And while I was acting, uh, I don't know if he resigned or what happened, but he's... He, he left on a permanent basis. So that was it. And then after some time they said, would you consider being the actual um, uh, GCE? And I said, well, that is fine, uh, especially because we, I think at that point, we were working on something that I thought could help us with uh, resolving the problem of load shedding, because it was about plant availability. Um, I said today that I did not resolve the problem of load shedding, and I mentioned young engineers who came up with the idea of Tetris that helped us resolve the problem of load shedding. So, I, mean, I, like, I, so I did not claim that I resolved load shedding. Is, is that how you arrived in, in Trustnet as well, where you just arrive in a huge state-owned corporation like ESCOM, and you do not even care to take uh, information from your predecessor? Is that how you arrived? And you, you didn't even get to know what was happening, what were developments. You just hit the ground running and, and focused on the, on the way forward. Yeah, I think this thing of handover is overrated. I've said that before. Um, the best way to appraise the situation is without the baggage of what had been happening in the past. And to get in there objectively, listen to everybody, listen make an appreciation of the situation on your own without, without being bombarded by um, the uh, perceptions or the problems of the past. So generally, um, incidentally, uh, Mr. Shivambu, when I went to the PIC, there was no handover. When I went to Transnet, there was no handover. When I went to ESCOM, there was no handover. And, um, I would not classify any of those assignments as uh, failures. And then the, the process of the request for proposals and the request for information which uh, ESCOM issued uh, concerning the nuclear build program, did it happen when you were in ESCOM? How did that come about? Where was that decision taken that ESCOM was going to procure uh, nuclear. It was a cabinet decision. It was a cabinet decision that we must start the RFP and RFI process for the procurement of nuclear. 
Yeah, I think there was a cabinet subcommittee and then a cabinet decision. And then you, you, you said perhaps uh, elsewhere that you went to familiarize yourself uh, with how nuclear energy functions. When did you do that and where? I did it in the course of uh, 2000 and I think 16 at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There is a course on uh, a nuclear reactor course, uh, a nuclear reactor technology. Uh, I did that course at uh, MIT. I thought I gave you a crash course on that at some point. Uh, the, uh, do you know? Do you know the uh, the time where the Oak Bay bought the uranium mine? Was it not around the same period? No. When, the, when, when was it? They bought the uranium mine when I was at the PIC. But the major investments of the Shiva arrangements and all of those, they didn't it happen Shiva when I was at the PIC. And then the listing, when did it happen? Didn't it happen uh, during the period that you were in ESCOM? I can't remember. I never followed that properly. And how then do you respond to a, a view that the whole rush to utilizing nuclear as another source of energy was linked, one, to Gupta's interest, two, to the fact that senior government officials took a bribe from the Russians uh, in order to implement a, a nuclear energy problem, a, a program, I meant to say. I don't know anything about those allegations, but from what I know, from a technical point of view, and what I know about Quebec, uh, is that Quebec is currently giving us the cheapest source of electricity. The problem with nuclear is that the upfront costs are very high, but the life of a nuclear plant is about 80 years with very cheap electricity. The, issue are the, the issues are the safety issues which can be managed, that have been managed. The United States has 99 nuclear reactors all over the United States. France gets over 70% of its electricity from nuclear. The Chinese are doing it. The Chinese are building nuclear reactors. I do not understand why we in Africa who do not have electricity are afraid of nuclear or we are being made to fear nuclear. From a technical point of view, without bringing in the politics and the Russians and so on and so forth, if we just look at the matter objectively and remove, uh, for example, if you say let's procure nuclear from a country that is competent to provide us with, uh, with uh, nuclear uh, reactors, um, uh, without naming what the country is, um, would you take, would you arrive at the same conclusion? I think people have... Uh, a fear for Russia that I don't understand. Uh, but I don't mind if we can obtain it from the United States or from China or from uh, the Japanese uh, who are very competent. The thing is we have to get, or the French even, uh, the thing is we have to get technology that is compatible with uh, what we already have here and what we already know, which is, uh, um, yeah. What, what, what by about, the way, what, what, what about the by the, the way, what about the, the concern that the present fiscal capacity can accommodate uh, a, a usually expensive nuclear build program? Isn't that a genuine concern? I have said that it is possible to fund this thing without touching the fiscus. Uh, what you do is uh, you ring fence future revenue from uh, the nuclear plants and uh, raise capital against that. Uh, that was my view anyway, and in fact, at the time when the Public Protector's report came out and I decided to take early retirement, uh, we had been working on possible financial models to do that. Uh, so it's objective. I mean, if people want to criticize that you can't do that, it must be on um, um, uh, technical 
on a technical basis, not uh, that uh, the Russians did that, minister signed the contract and so on and so forth. What, 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 what do you mean? I mean, are you saying that we must not care about the fiscal complica the, uh, complications and, uh, uh, and, and consequences of nuclear, we must just look at the technical issues, narrowly like that. Is that what you're saying? No, but we're going to the other extreme here. We're forgetting the technical issues completely. Then, then you, your, your justification of the together deal is uh, optimum coal had already given or had already sold the coal to together and that prepayments are standard in ESCOM. You then give the prepayment to together so that they could give you the coal and they ultimately deliver the coal. And then through an arbitration process, the 2.1 billion which OCH was owing to ESCOM was later on reduced to about 600 million. Why is it that that prepayment that you gave to Tegeta was exactly the same amount which Tegeta needed to purchase uh, optimum coal holdings or mine? It wasn't. If you look at uh, P.S. Marsden's testimony, he says they were short of 600 million. And how much did we pay? Uh, we bought coal for 586. I think you must revisit those figures there because the figures that were given here point to the fact that the exact amount that was needed to conclude the deal is what ESCOM ultimately paid. In a, in a meeting which was called midnight, a, just the day before the deal could expire or the deal could flop. Uh, yeah. How do you explain that? Don't yeah. you think that you are being utilized as a vehicle or as a means to close a deal for a, yeah, a Gupta firstly, and Duduzane Zuma's owned company? Yeah. Firstly, I have said I had not been at that meeting. I was not at that meeting uh, on the 11th, uh, firstly. But secondly, uh, in understanding the transaction, because I did get to understand it, uh, P.S. Marsden's thing talks about 600 million that he even tried to go and borrow from the banks and they refused to give it to him. It was 600 million. The deal was 586 million to provide coal for three months, May, June, and July. The coal was provided. Now, the cost of load shedding, which is the cost of not having if we had not had the coal, for example, for one reason or another, and we were running short of supplies of coal during winter. Uh, I heard today uh, Veneta Lane saying it is um, 450 million rand a day, a day. If we can avoid load shading by doing a prepayment and buying coal, prepaying coal and making sure that we have coal, if we had not done it, you would be asking us today, Mr. Shivambo, why didn't you do that deal so that you can avoid load shedding? And then what, what is it? Can you please just take us through the process that uh, reduced the amount which Optimum Coal was owing has come from 2.1 billion to 600 million. What exactly happened? That was after I had left. But my understanding is that uh, the matter went for arbitration, which so the person who did that was uh, Machela Kuku, was the acting CEO. Yeah, and the CFO. They will come here and, and you can ask them what, yeah, because it was okay, actually no, that's fine. Yeah, we, apparently we, very, very technical. And then the McKinsey Trillion uh, Consulting Services, did it happen when we were in ESCO? The consulting services happened. I'm speaking about this specific one, which, which ended up with the, the 1.5 billion yeah, rand payment. The payment Did it happen made, when you were in ESCOM? The payments were made during this year. Yeah? This year. I but left, the whole consulting services happened I when you were still in the ESCOM. First, there was a, a, an agreement with McKenzie, and that they would subcontract to Trillion. The question was, was there an agreement to subcontract, the subcontracting agreement? There are different versions of what happened there, and I'm sure that uh, when uh, Mr. Singh comes here, he will be able to explain. But it involved getting permission 
from the Treasury to get the subcontracting agreement to be done. Now, there's a difference of opinion as to whether that permission was granted or not. But I'm not, that can be shed light on by uh, Mr. Singh and uh, yeah, I think Mr. Kobo. In, yeah, we'll deal with it there. The, uh, you say that uh, you, are, you have not subjected the state of capture report of the public protector to a judicial review because of a, a legal advice. What legal advice is that? Because you, you I'm, I'm saying this because in your official submission, you are trying to turn upside down the observations or notes, whatever you call them, of the public protector. Uh, you, you, go, you go into town saying that, no, the phones are not nine way. I call it this number and all of those things there. What kind of legal advice is that you should not do a judicial review? What does it say? It says the report had no findings. So if the report has no findings, there's nothing to review. But even if it doesn't have uh, findings, uh, Colonel Mulefe, the, the observations, its status is that it has got a local stand, it has got a legal standing as a perspective. And your, your counting, your countenance to what is contained in the public protector report means absolutely nothing because you are, not, you, are, you, are, you are not authority, you are not law. And the public protector's office, as has been confirmed by the constitutional court, is authority that is established by the constitution. Senior counsel disagrees with you, and I'm not the lawyer, I take legal advice. But, but isn't that pretty obvious that, that uh, a report of the public protector, which has got a legal standing, which is established by the constitution, which is established additionally by the public protector act, make certain observations about your movements, about your conduct, and everything else, and then you fold your arms and say, no, I'm not going to say anything, but when you come here, you want us to listen to you, and you want us to believe what you are saying against a, a legal document that is a product of investigation by the Office of the Public Protector. How, 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 how should we relate to your information vis-a-vis -vis the Public Protector's information? Well, council says the Constitutional Court has said findings. Well, what is the name of the council? Uh, what Graves. is his name? Mr. Graves. Oh, Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, Matun. Okay. What does it say? It says the Constitutional Court has said findings are binding. I don't know what that means. So it is a matter that has been ventilated about there has to be findings. And my reading of it is that until there are findings, it's just fresh air. Do you know, do you know a... Uh, the uh, findings, right, and remedial action are a product of investigation in terms of what the public protector would otherwise do. You can't say that in a public protector report, the only thing that is binding is the tail end and what have been the observations, the building blocks towards the finding do not matter. Like, Let's give an example with Nkanda. There's certain findings which are possibly one page. And those findings are a product of the events that happened with Minente, the architect, which happened with the officials in the public works department and all of those things there. Those are the building blocks to the ultimate end. And then the findings are the ones that then say that this is what we think should be remedial action. Isn't that basic logic, uh, Kenel? Well, Mr. Um, Shivam, that was the legal advice that I got, and I am not competent in that area. And so maybe I will live to regret it one day. Uh, that uh, let's yeah let's 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 so, yeah, let's I'm, do this. Let's do this. I think that is what we will be the attitude of. Uh, I think that should be the attitude of the, the committee as well, that unless the observations and the notes and the building blocks of the public protector have been 
uh, reviewed in a judicial process. We're going to take them as fact, as final. We can't, because you are not authority of law, we can't say that uh, uh, Kennel, uh, Brian Molefe has uh, given us an alternate vision and then we're going to compare that against the public protector, which is a constitutional establishment. And then we, we are not sure what we would want to believe. We have got no choice as parliament. We have to take the part of the public protector. Is that a sensible approach? No. <laughs> Why not? It just isn't the sensible approach. Like, how, how, are you saying that? I have said, Mr. Shivambo, that. Uh, are, are you I'm, saying, I'm are you saying that this have, like, compared to your, your information, your note here, we must believe you instead of the public protector? Is that what we are saying we should do? I've given you the answer that there was nothing to review. There were no findings. That yeah, is but what I'm the saying in say. terms of the if observations that are there, because the, the public protector says that I, I have you have received 45 calls from Ajay Gupta, you have been very close to Ajay okay. Gupta, which is a okay. solid observation. Mr. Who do we believe now in terms of the legal standing? The, your lawyer is there, he can whisper to you again. Who do we believe between you and the public protector? Mr. And Shivambo, can you tell me the phone calls from Mr. Ajay Gupta? One phone call from which number? When? But the public protector has dealt with that. I'm not no, investigating the issue. She hasn't. But it's there in the public it's protector's not there. report. She just says there were phone calls. She doesn't say when and how, from which number. But it, it's, it has got legal standing. It's, it has got weight no, because it, it comes from public standing. protector. My legal advice is that it does not have legal standing. Just because you want it to have legal standing does not mean it has legal standing, Mr. Shivam. I know you're a very powerful man from the EFF. But just because you have a desire for it to have legal standing <laughs> does not automatically make it to have legal standing. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Do, do you know, do you know Mr. Mulefe, uh, if I don't know what is the tragedy now because your lawyer is sitting next to you and he is misleading you in, in a profound and spectacular way, right? You rather you were because my the, lawyer. The, 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 uh, so it's, it's just basic logic. Let us, let's live, let's, let's, let's... But Mr. Shivambu, yes. I will choose him as a lawyer than you. Or, or you can choose a constitutional structure which is established no, by the Constitution. I will not choose Ms. Matonsela Or you can choose the lawyer. Constitutional Court's interpretation of public protector reports. No, Mr. No. Which say that the reports of the public protector are binding unless subject to judicial review. There's no finding. What... Like, the context is that the findings are a product of a process of investigation and observations. That process was not finished, Mr. Shivambo. The public protector says these matters must be investigated further. That process was not finished. She was in a hurry to finish this report. It was not finished properly. I don't understand why. She did not allow the new public protector to finish the investigation. She was in too much of a hurry to call it the final report. No, no that's no, fine. I think we'll deal with that at, the, at a different level. The last question is, what is the definition of retirement? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm exiting now. What is the definition of retirement? Or oh, you can ask I the lawyer again. No, I can Google it. Okay, yeah, 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 please do. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Shivamu, let me look for it and then I'll come back to you on it. No, no, please, 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 because there's a clear context which you want to deal with. What is retirement? Because my, my reading of retirement is that when you leave employment permanently, in a public statement that you issued, you said that I'm leaving ESCOM, I'm exploring what next step to take, and uh, less than four months later, you are sworn in as a member of parliament, which is the next step, which nullifies the notion of a big debt letter that you are retired from ESCOM. Isn't that the case? Yeah, the retirement has the effect that uh, you have left. Oh, so, so if, you, if you leave employment as a retirement, is that your, your definition? No, you can resign, you can retire, you can... 
But I'm, I'm asking about retirement, your understanding of retirement. Are you saying that if I leave parliament and decide to be full-time international relations officer in the head office of the EFF tomorrow, I'll say I have retired. Even when I'm in, in the immediate aftermath of my retirement, and then I say I'm retiring, and then I'm... Is that the term? If you write a letter to parliament yes. and ask to retire, and parliament says, we have approved your application to retire, then you are retired. Isn't that simplistic, uh, Kenya? Things don't need to be complicated, <laughs> Mr. Shwambo. You don't have to complicate everything. <laughs> Do, do, you know, do you know that we will deal with the merits and, and, and assessment of your submissions? But the fact of the matter, Chair, is that uh, Mr. Brian Mulliver did not retire from ESCOM. He resigned and he publicly communicated that it was accepted by the board and by the minister. And when the narrative of his pension fund could not be fit, properly by his resignation. He then claimed that he has resigned and then big dated a letter uh, of retirement to Mr. Ben Gobane who by all means and, and purposes is not a credible human being. But we'll deal with that when we come to assessment and recommendations of what should uh, happen with the whole uh, information that is being provided here. Chair, I think that it is unfortunate that what Mr. Shivambo is trying to do is to um, force feed the findings of this uh, uh, August uh, uh, committee in its work. I think, Mr. Shivambo, today we made the presentation, the questions were asked. That comment must be reserved for when you want to make the findings. Uh, I think it is a bit premature for you to be jumping to conclusions at this early stage. Thank you very much. That was the last response. And uh, Honorable Shivambu, you have exceeded Honorable Mazzoni's record. I'm recording all the minutes yeah, today, now, this, this evening. Uh,